okay i hope i am audible to all students who are attending this lecture of development economics part 1 we continue with our lectures on economic development formally this is chapter 2 of the book i prefer to follow for my lectures on economic development this is development economics by devraj ray okay now students can recall that in the previous lecture we were looking at the gross national product as one of the criteria for comparing the countries and measuring their development and we had also looked at what are the problems with using gross national product as a criteria for uh, comparing the development across the economies okay we had talked about the measurement issues and we had learned in the previous lecture that uh, when we talk about the concept of economic development it is not only to do with a higher level of gross national product but it also pretty much depends upon how the social indicators like health like life expectancy like literacy rates of the economy are performing and although we would expect Uh, the social indicators and the per capita gnp to reinforce each other empirically the correlation has not found to be too much significant that means uh, a focus only on gross national product per se to measure development would not be a desired or i can say a good feature we also need to focus on the social indicators okay so we had covered all this in the previous lecture we had looked at measurement issues in the previous lecture and this is where we had learned that uh, per capita income although per capita income is an important feature it's not the only feature okay now in this particular lecture what we are looking at is so students can scroll down and you can come to this paragraph i hope all students who are attending this lecture have also opened up their readings because i will be making you mark the important points for this particular lecture and you are only requested to learn up those important points while at the same time understanding the concept okay so in this lecture we are looking at reason for large disparities between the per capita incomes in different countries what are the reasons that the per capita incomes are so dispersed when it comes to comparing the poor nations with the rich nations in other words to make things simple what is the reason for the developing and underdeveloped countries to have such low per capita incomes and the developed countries to have such high per capita incomes what is the reason for the disparities so we start today's lecture with this particular question so i am going to make all students mark the important points concerning this question so first point as you can see on your screen under reporting of income is a common practice in developing countries all of us know that developing countries and underdeveloped countries have a very large size of the black economy black economy consists of those transactions which are hidden from the government and what is the reason for under reporting of income obviously that would be higher taxes that would be one plausible reason Uh, another reason would be that the tax collection systems in themselves are not efficient as those prevailing in the industrialized developed or market economies there is a greater incentive to under report income or output for tax purposes the national income may not be comprehensive as well so two reasons bad or inefficient tax collection systems in the developing economies and larger size of the black economy are the reasons for the reported per capita incomes in the developing economies to be much below the that of the developed economies the developed economies have a lower size of the black economy i am not saying that the black economy size is zero in developed countries developed countries do also have black economy but the size is very less or very low and at the same time the tax collection systems are too efficient in the developed economies which causes the reported per capita incomes in developed economies to be higher okay in addition students can mark this point also this is within point 1 in addition the proportion of income that is actually generated for self consumption is relatively high in the developing countries now this is also 
an important point. Develop in developing countries, a large proportion of the income is used for self-consumption. Instead of getting traded in the market, it's used for self-consumption. Because we know that developing countries have a large share of the working population in the agricultural sector. And in the agricultural sector, a lot of output, a lot of agricultural output which is produced is consumed by the farmers only. It doesn't pass through the market. So the proportion of the population living in the rural sector in developing countries is large. Many of these individuals are subsistence farmers who grow crops that they themselves consume. Such output may not be reported adequately. So if I sum up point one, one reason for large disparities between the per capita income in developing and developed countries is that Developing countries have large black economy. Tax collection systems are inefficient. Large proportion of the income is used for self-consumption purposes. Why? Because a large proportion of the working population lives in the rural areas and is dependent on agriculture. So most of the output produced is used by the subsistence farmers for their own consumption. So this was point number one. Okay, let's come to point number two. A far more serious issue comes from the fact that now let's look at the monetary reasons. The prices for many goods in all the countries are not appropriately reflected in the exchange rates. Okay, now if students have taken up my intermediate macroeconomics part two course where we have done the open economy models. Remember in our lectures on exchange rate determination, we had said that when we were doing the concept of purchasing power parity. We had learned in the intermediate macro part two course that there are certain goods which do not cross international borders. For example, services provided by a salon, haircuts, etc. So certain goods are not traded. And since these goods are not traded, you cannot convert them in, into international prices. So Look at the next sentence. This is only natural for goods and services that are not internationally traded. Exchange rates are just prices and the level of these prices depends only on the commodities that cross international borders. This is important. You can put an international price only to that commodity which is getting imported or exported. But there are a lot of commodities which are not traded in the world market. You cannot quote international prices for such commodities. So the price of non-traded goods such as infrastructure and many services do not affect the exchange rates. What is interesting is that there is a systematic way in which these non-traded prices are related to the level of development. So it is it is these commodities which are not traded which cause the differences in the per capita income. Because poor countries are poor, you would expect them to have relatively low prices for non-traded goods. Their lower real incomes do not suffice to pull these prices up to the international levels. Obviously, guys, in poor economies, you would expect the price of non-traded goods to be lower. On the other hand, in richer economies, the price of non-traded goods are expected to be higher. So lower prices would ultimately lead to lower real incomes. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, and these lower real income would not be sufficient to drive up the prices to the international level. So conversion of all the incomes to US dollars using the exchange rates underestimates the real income of the poor countries. Okay, so uh, the point I'm trying to make here, another important point here is when we talk about developing countries, they have low prices. Now, low prices would mean higher real incomes. But obviously, how do we capture real income? Real income is nothing but income divided by the price level, which captures the purchasing power of income. If I am living in a developing or an underdeveloped economy, the price of non-traded goods and services is lower. 
as a result my purchasing power is more but that is not captured because of the fact that i cannot convert non traded goods and services into international prices and if i convert them into an international currency say dollars dollars will not be able to capture uh, the real incomes of the poorer countries it is going to underestimate the real income of the poorer countries why because actually the price in the poorer countries is lower but that is not captured when you convert them to dollars so if i sum up the whole paragraph if i sum up the whole paragraph what is it telling us point 2 is telling us that another reason for uh, the disparity in per capita incomes between the rich and the poorer nations is because there exists a certain set of non traded goods and services in both the rich economies also and the poor economies also since these goods do not cross international borders you cannot quote an international price for them okay you would expect the price of non traded goods and services to be lower in the poorer countries and higher in the richer countries and as a result you cannot compare the per capita incomes if you compare you will see that it leads to underestimation of the real income of the poor countries so hoping all students have understood point number 2 and then another point i want to make clear in point number 2 is that since poor countries also have lower incomes what does this line mean lower real incomes do not suffice to pull these prices up to the international level obviously the demand in the poor countries will be less because incomes are also less when demand is less it will not cause prices to go up when do prices rise prices rise only when demand goes up and demand goes up when your income goes up in the poorer countries people have lower incomes as a result the demand less as a result prices are not going to go up to the international level so if you are converting uh, to an international currency say us dollar it's going to underestimate the real income of the poorer countries okay this was point number 2 now we can scroll downward whatever i am not making you mark you can skip it from exam point of view you can read it in your leisure time but only the points i am making you mark are the points which you should learn up from examination point of view okay then point number 2 is getting continued here point 2 continue if you scroll down so international prices are constructed for an enormous basket of goods and services how do we construct the international prices you simply average out the prices of all the commodities in the basket by averaging the prices for each such good and service over all different countries this is how you construct an international price index you take a basket of goods and services you add up the prices of all the goods and services and you divide by the total number of goods and services i hope all students know how to find the average sum of all prices in the basket divided by total number of items in the basket and that is the same exercise you do for every country so national income for a country is then estimated by valuing its output at these international prices so whatever output is produced in the economy the physical output produced in the economy is multiplied by this international price which gives you the value how do you find the value value is nothing but price into quantity so whatever output or whatever quantity is produced in every economy you multiply it by the international price which gives you the value of output so in this way we are maintaining something called the purchasing power parity now purchasing power if you measure uh, the development of two economies using the concept of purchasing power parity you will see that the disparity is going to get reduced but again this fall in disparity may not be significant so look at this line purchasing power parity estimates of per capita income go some way towards reducing the astonishing disparities in the world distribution of income but not all the way although purchasing power parity concept is an improvement in the sense that 
you are converting all the prices to international prices, and then you are comparing the purchasing power between different countries. That is going to reduce the disparity, but not completely eliminate it. The point I am trying to make here is comparing the development of economies using the concept of purchasing power parity will surely help to reduce the uh, disparity of per capita incomes between different nations, but it's not going to completely eliminate the disparity. So measured in the per purchasing power parity dollars, developing countries although do better relative to the US per capita GNP, although the fractions are still small to be sure. The situation reflects the fact that domestic prices are not captured adequately by using the exchange at conversions because of a limited set of traded goods. So again, this point is also highlighting the fact that although purchasing power parity might be an improvement in um, comparing the uh, development of the poorer with the richer nations, but the problem here is that again, there will always exist some non-traded goods and services for which you cannot convert them to international price and you cannot do a comparison of the rich and the poorer nations. So although PPP, purchasing power parity concept, does reduce the disparity, but it is not going to eliminate it because of existence of non-traded goods and services for which the exchange rate conversions are not going to work. Okay, then now we come to point number three. So point number two is over till here. Till here, we had point number two. Now comes point number three. Another possible reason for the disparities in per capita incomes. So there are other subtle problems of measurement. GNP measurement, when it accounts for the exchange rate problem, uses the market prices that is to convert highly disparate goods into a common currency. Now, Point number three is highlighting the fact that GNP is going to focus on market prices, but there are certain commodities which do not have market prices. Let's look at that example. The theoretical justification for this is that market prices reflect people's preferences as well as scarcities. Therefore, such prices represent appropriate conversion scale to use. Although market prices are should be used, market prices should be used for conversion because market prices are going to reflect the preferences of the public as well as relative scarcities but not all the markets are perfectly competitive all of us know in perfectly competitive markets price is set by the industry and everyone in the industry takes the price as given and all of us know that in perfectly competitive markets prices are flexible because they are set by the industry they are not set by bargaining between the firms and the workers but guys in real life Always remember, in real life economics, perfect competition is a myth. In real life, we have monopolies, oligopolistic competition, public sector companies. And then we talk about monopolies and oligopolistic competition. The prices are not really flexible. They are rigid. And there is markup. Monopolists and oligopolists sell at dictated prices. On the other hand, when the government makes expenditure on bureaucracy, on military, on space research, they do not use market price. They use the cost of production. Government always provides goods and services at the cost of production, not at the market price. We have done all this in our introductory macroeconomics course also, when we were doing national income accounting in our introductory macroeconomics course. We had learned that the government never sells at market price. The government sells at factor cost, factors of production, cost of the factors of production. So conventional measures of GNP ignore the, there's one more point, GNP, or I can say the market price does not capture externalities. We have done externalities in our intermediate microeconomics part two course. Market price does not capture the costs arising from pollution, costs arising from environmental damage, and so on. So in all of these cases, the market price or the prevalent prices do not capture the true marginal social value or the cost of a good or service. When we talk about externalities, the price should capture the social marginal cost, not the private marginal cost. We have done this in our lectures on externalities in our intermediate microeconomics part two course. 
So if I sum up point number three, point number three is telling us the reasons why market price may not be the appropriate criteria in some of the cases. Why? Because although market price should be the criteria because it adequately captures the people's preferences and scarcities of commodities, the problem is that there are, uh, in the real life, you don't have perfect competition. You have oligopolistic competition, monopolistic competition, where the prices are not that much flexible. There are rigidities. Also, uh, under imperfect competition, the commodities are sold at dictated prices. When we talk about the government sector, the government never sells or provides goods or services at the market price. The government always provides goods and services at the factors of production. And another problem with using market prices that it does not capture the impact of externalities. Hence, GNP, which makes use of the market price, may not be an appropriate criteria for comparing the richer and the poorer nations because GNP relies only on the market price, but market price will not be suited for a certain cases as we have seen in point number three. Okay, so students, this is where I intend to stop in this particular lecture. If I sum up, what we have covered in this lecture is three points or three valid reasons as to why there are large disparities between the per capita income in the rich and the poorer nations. This was the agenda for today's lecture. So these three points are to be learned up by all students who are attending this lecture. You can only learn up the points which I'm making you mark. This is strictly from examination point of view. If you have time, you should read all the paragraphs. But since it's a theoretical topic, I will be only focusing in my lectures on concepts or points which are important from examination point of view. To increase your knowledge, you should read up and go through all figures also. Okay, so in the next lecture, we are going to start with historical experience. I mean to say in the next lecture, I'll start from this topic. And we are going to underline and understand whatever points are important starting from this topic. So I stop in this lecture. I hope all students have enjoyed this lecture. Any doubt, you can unmute your mic and ask or call up or mail me your doubts at Divine School of Economics at the rate gmail.com. This is where I stop in this lecture.